along those lines. Um, and it's really nice to have you here. So let me go ahead and get started. And welcome, Juliet, and uh, everybody here for our ODNC Symposia series at the Schmidt Horst College of Business. And that's our doctorate in organizational development and organization development and change program is a sponsor and host of this. Our main focus is on showcasing the work of our doctoral students and their work that they're putting out in the world. We uh, really pride ourselves on thought leadership and this notion of uh, professional joy and how people can maximize their career through building their brand and really focused on this notion of, I don't know, Julie, if, you, if, you, if I've, you've, you've heard the term uh, uh, passive income where you make money while you sleep. I like to think of passive difference making where people make a difference while they sleep. So like in art, you do art, you're making a difference while you sleep as other people enjoy it while you're not maybe there and it gets shared around the world and shared with other people. In the same sense, uh, our doctoral students are working to build their professional brand around their thought leadership, the area that they're passionate about as they focus on transforming organizations, revitalizing communities and developing human potential. And in that pursuit of professional joy, the joy that's experienced when we get to do that around the thing we care about, uh, that's really uh, a great achievement. And I think it's something that all of our students aspire to achieve. And so we have our doctorate. We also have the oldest program in the nation and some would say the world around organization development and change, a master's program that was started in 1975. And we're in the College of Business, which is AACSB accredited and Higher Learning Commission accredited. So there's a lot of really good credentials behind the program and our students and what they're bringing to the table. And the coolest thing is you all that are here, our students, are meeting Juliet because in addition to our students being showcased in these symposia, we also bring thought leaders in, people who are out doing the work and, and to connect with in our program. And we get to come and meet you in person, Juliet, and come over next year. And we're shooting for May, but we got to know more. We're still working with the COVID and pandemic details. We'll know more as time goes. But uh, our plans are to be out there with you and to visit the Tavistock Institute, meet your students, uh, engage, share ideas, work on social impact project, and go from London to Amsterdam to Paris and have a great, great experience uh, in our inter international study tour. So uh, it's, this is a beginning for all of you. This is a beginning of, of our relationship with uh, Kirsten, who presented uh, in a pri previous symposia, and now Juliet. And so I'm, I'm super excited and grateful that you made the time to be here with us. And the purpose of these sessions is to showcase and it's to bring evidence-based perspectives to those who are transforming organizations, revitalizing communities and developing human potential. And what we'll do is we'll have this little opening and introduction, and then we're gonna move right, Juliet, I'm gonna hand it off right to you. And then after you're done, we're going to go into small groups and they're going to discuss what they heard, what the reactions are, and what questions they have. And we'll give, you know, seven minutes for the small group discussion. We'll come back and we'll have a reflective conversation with you. They'll reflect on what they heard, they'll reflect on their questions, ask you questions, and then I'll wrap up with some reflection just overall uh, on what, what did we hear and what themes and what our takeaways are. And then we'll discuss the next session. And so Let's not wait any longer and jump in. So Juliet is at the Tavistock Institute and she's uh, doing some of the most interesting and creative and really practical work. And uh, the focus today is on organizational care and curation, curation and really this notion of the art supporting the becoming of new knowledge and practice, which is really cool. And uh, your background, Juliet's background is in organizational change and development as well as the visual arts where your, her focus is on uh, the practice of still life. I like that notion of still life, the representation of groups, objects, different forms and scales, um, relationships, states of recognition and, and predominance. And your studio, it's kind of, I love the name, studio in Bainbridge Printmaking in Elephant and Castle in London. I love, I love uh, all of that. <laughs> And uh, so 
Juliet, thank you for making the time to be here with us. And I'd like to go ahead and share the screen with you. If you want to go ahead and take take the screen, I'm going to stop sharing. You want to take the screen and screen and uh, take us through your presentation for today. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I like that Elephant and Castle is just up the road uh, from where I'm sitting now in southeast London. Uh, but the idea of a tour of Europe um, is as exotic to me as it might sound to all of you at the moment. Uh, so um, I'm definitely entertaining, I, you know, dreaming about uh, going to Paris and Berlin and Denmark and places that uh, you know normally we, we have the freedom to, to, to travel to. So really, really hope that uh, you will uh, make it here next year. Um, and I think there's a fair degree of optimism around that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so before I start sort of screen um, sharing, um, just to kind of maybe do a bit of like transitioning in, crossing the boundary, um, that's kind of Tavistock language for those of you that are familiar with it. Um, my understanding is that, you know, we're here as a group of people concerned with change and social change. Um, and the story that I'm going to try and tell is a story of working across disciplines, um, but of bringing an integrated practice um, as an artist um, and um, an OD and change consultant to change processes. So I do both of those things. Um, and I'm interested in that. And I think that one of the kind of you know, important things to also try and convey is that these methods are very strongly behind social change movements at the moment, such as Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, um, movements that are think that are radical, disruptive, performative, you know, where they're kind of really playing with stages, with questions of systems, chaos and complexity in their work. So that's kind of, you know, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so it's thinking in different ways about change but also showing the rigor and the science about it behind it, because we tend to split off arts and science, you know, and at the Tavistock Institute, we're very much about the whole kind of like perspective of science, arts, you know, they're all integrated, they're all part of one thing. Um, so yeah, try not to split those, those aspects off, which happen a lot and are part of kind of organizational life. Um, and it's also thinking that we don't always have to be explicit about a change intervention um, and, and hopefully sharing with you kind of ways in which we haven't been explicit about a change intervention. Um, and, um, you, you know, like, you know, not using the standard canons, but kind of like working in other shapes and forms when we're thinking about change. Um, working with not knowing and emergent processes um, and, um, through this the new program that um, we've launched this year, Deepening Creative Practice, um, what I also want to sort of show is the way that we've been developing this kind of practice through working with artists and working with curatorial process. So through images, I'm gonna work through images, not through kind of models or, or words. Um, I'm gonna to start to, or try to tell that kind of a story. That's my aim for today. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So you're all there with the images you can see my screen great. So yeah, the idea to talk about organizational care and curation, hopefully that will kind of come through as a kind of practice and the arts is supporting new knowledge and practice. So new knowledge, really part of sort of, you know, change processes really um, as we think about them. Um, so I've got to start off by reading a poem. And the poem's called R.W. A man from the highlands displaced in our midst, he's quite annoying and misunderstood. Separated from family reasons unknown, was a high flyer who hit the ground. His needs are complex, some unknown even to himself. Angry, frustrated, needs control, impact on others significant and challenging. His love is canine, sci-fi and tech. This replaces a human need unmet. Vulnerable, scared, smoke and mirrors comes into play. He shouldn't be ours, 
but he is, and we must help. ICARES responded, a DN team sent with treatment, dressings, and much resent. Physical care needs are met, but the iceberg remains, remains unexplained. As we say, work in progress. Um, so this poem is an object um, and an artifact. Um, and we, this poem was what created um, by a team of uh, leaders uh, 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 leading a, um, uh, an integrated care system within the NHS system. And we're working with them um, on a program which is about developing their um, practice in unconscious processes. Um, and we started off this program by really drawing attention to the person at the center um, of their system and how they could kind of illuminate um, and bring, um, uh, bring some understanding about the person and the system, you know, into their um, work and, and their understanding into the program. So the poem that I've just read was created by them. Um, and to me links to something um, around um, pathos. So pathos as an appeal to an audience emotions in order to evoke feeling. So pathos is a key component of literature, and I would argue as also a key component of research or change processes, which like most other forms of art, um, we need to sort of, you know, inspire emotions and understand who that person is at the centre um, of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and um, so it's the drawing in, um, a connection with the person's experience as it's happening. Um, and thinking about this imaginative quality of research and storytelling. Um, the detail or kind of in complexity theory, so going into science, the fractal, you know, right into the center to the point of intervention to sort of understand a little bit better. And in contrast to that, I just really want to show this, um, this is one of my uh, uh, illustrations and it's work um, that I, that. Um, I've done with um, an organization called Entelechi Arts who work with older people in the community and with people with profound learning um, disabilities. Um, and uh, this is one of the, the drawings I did attending uh, one of the, the sessions, which again is a little bit about this sort of question of pathos and the person at the center and just sort of really kind of revealing their kind of humanity uh, that I'm interested in. So the second image that I want to show, because uh, I'm telling a bit of my story as well, um, is an image of Michelangelo's crucifixion, um, Christ on the cross. And this is a drawing that he did very, very late in his life. Um, and I'm, I'm showing it really to sort of, really as part of the story um, to tell, to sort of explain how I am understanding more and more that all of my work is as an artist. So it's that splitting off thing. And where my colleagues at the Institute have really encouraged me not to split off myself as an artist and to see that artist as part of my overall practice and the work that I do. But that's been a journey. And I certainly did used to do that. I was very separate with my artistic self and where it was located. And I think a lot of artists do that. And a lot of people do that in terms of their kind of organizational roles. And that was very evident yesterday when I was working with a group of NHS leaders uh, around a performance um, and creating a performance, which we did on Zoom. But a lot of them really characterized themselves as not being creative. Um, and of course, as we got through to the end of the day, we were, the, the manifestation was the most extraordinary creative production um, in the context of the, the, the circumstances. Um, so, as an artist, so as an artist, I need to work in. I'm really beginning to understand that as an artist, I need to work in multiple roles. Um, but that is a, an identity that gives the tone to all of my work, um, and that's energizing and exciting versus the energies when we split off those parts of ourselves in relation to the complexity of what it is that we're trying to do. And a number of us are working like this at the Institute and bringing artistic and other practice into our work. 
So some of those other practices are Alexander technique, so uh, an embodied technique kind of rooted in the Gestalt uh, tradition, um, dance um, and um, poetry. So social scientists who are extraordinarily talented poets as well, which links back to that kind of question of pathos. Um, so just a little bit about who we are at the Institute, the Tavistock Institute, in case you don't know, you know, so who the contemporary organization is. Um, um, it's that we're a social science organization, we're a not-for-profit. Um, we're engaged in research, consultancy, organizational change, um, but we're um, in the not-for-profit um, in the UK, in Europe, and we have internationally, we're very well known for our group relations work and have affiliations with organizations in America, such as the AK Rice Institute through that work and, 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 and through our history. Um, we're also nested in a very, uh, and steeped in a very rich history. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I've done a lot of work with our archive um, that was about um, supporting us to be both kind of connected and liberating us from our past. Um, and that's kind of relevant um, in terms of thinking about different types of interventions that sort of support uh, change in organizations. Um, so where did this come from in me and how does it relate to this image? You're probably uh, wondering. Uh, it, it came from my um, attendance really um, quite early on um, in joining the Institute in a group relations conference. So group relations conferences are experiential learning. So we set up a sort of temporary organization over a period of time where we learn about ourselves in groups. Um, and um, you know, through through the experiential unfolding um, and interactions that kind of take place um, in, in the conference, um, and I uh, attended one of these conferences, and um, in that conference was really um, came into contact with imagery. Um, and with myself as an artist and in a way with the way I got very interested in the way that the groups create images, um, but also as you, you could begin to see groups as and, 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 our, and, our, and our work and our sort of participation in groups um, as sort of, you know, related to artworks. So this relates to some early teaching from an art teacher um, who taught um, about drawing and um, he spoke about light um, so when we think about this kind of a drawing we're thinking about it as sort of mo a modulation so the light is coming from a constant the light coming from a constant source will shine upon one side of the fold brightly if we're thinking about a renaissance drawing um, but in this situation we're thinking about a body um, and that's known as direct light um, and as the form turns away from the light, it becomes darkness. And it's just that turning away from the light is described as turn of form dark. And then after that, so we're thinking in sculptural terms, but on a piece of paper, um, the shadow becomes reflected light, which is a softer, gentler light reflected from the direct light that throws itself onto the fold, the following fold. And this is what I began to see as happening in the group experience as conversation dynamics moved from one person to another. So groups as moving between those different states of light, turn of form dark, reflected light in their processes. And um, that, that's, so this is where it all began to start for me. And I suppose that's what I'm sort of trying to kind of illuminate. Um, so the telling a story about life through an image and how it's drawn, it's not just about the subject matter um, and that's what makes a drawing profound and meaningful. Um, and Michelangelo was doing this right at the end of his life. So they started to become, the drawings became much more kind of blurred and spiritual, but the meaning the sort of infused in them was much sort of stronger. So that's a little bit of where it began for me. Um, so I'm now kind of moving on 
um, to talk a little bit. This, th these are some of the works that I've done from as an artist from the Tavistock Institute's archive. Um, and it's where I've worked with um, projective identification cards. And I don't know whether any of you are, you may be familiar with the Rorschach technique, which is the, uh, the splat of paint onto a, a piece of paper and then it's, it's, it's sort of folded and then reopened up again and uh, it creates an image um, and used in psychology to sort of understand what kind of image we project onto um, that sort of, you know, the abstract paint. Um, these were um, within the, the Institute's archive, um, the psychoanalyst analysts used these sort of kind of very sort of murky sort of mystery drawings uh, to um, uh, in, in a similar way to sort of understand uh, projective identification um, with 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 their their analyzans, people who were in, in 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 therapy, and I became interested in them as part of our archive project. Uh, so this was sort of part of the work that I was doing. Um, but again, the story that I'm kind of interested to talk, kind of tell is. Um, the archive or the Tavistock, you know, my work with the Tavistock Institute's archive as an intervention. So as an organizational development and change intervention. So working with history, um, uh, as, and, but, but as, and, 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 and the, so the change project um, was the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations itself. Um, and that's quite complex because you're working with people who are sophisticated, uh, social scientists and change agents. So, you know, what 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 type of um, things um, and, and interventions might support a sort of different sense and coming into knowing um, of, of, of itself. So with the archive project, we were working with the past, the present and the future to, to affect dynamic change and support innovation of, of, pra of practice um, versus or sort of against um, a quite strong attachment to the figures of the past. So figures who you may or may not be familiar with, I, 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 I'm, I'm less aware of that in terms of the things that you're learning within the programme, but kind of notions of socio-technical systems, um, Wilfred Beyond's work. Uh, so a lot of kind of like big names, Kurt Lewin, um, are, 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 are nested in that past. Um, so that the things we started to think about um, within the archive were that there was potentiality, there was a kind of energy um, in the matter, um, so in the material, um, and that um, in, in the social change that was sort of written down uh, through, you know, in the in the kind of reflective notes um, uh, and material kind of in the archive. Um, and we worked um, through some of these emotions that were kind of held um, in the process. So the emotions of excavating uh, the past um, and, 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 and working with the past um, it, 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 through this project um, that was about opening up the Institute's archive, making it accessible uh, to a kind of like much wider community. Um, and we did this with the, uh, the Welcome Library um, in uh, London, uh, the Wellcome Institute being a, 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 a huge uh, foundation that um, uh, um, supports uh, sort of health, uh, uh, you know, change and health and kind of um, science, health science, um, but it, it, both in the UK, but also uh, gl gl globally. Um, so the archive project was one about uh, participation and democratic processes, so working out loud um, and um, culminated in um, uh, uh, our 70th anniversary uh, festival um, in 2017. Just oh, hold on. So this is a um, this is the first um, this is a, a, an item from the archive, um, which shows um, 
it's the first page of the publications ledger um, of the Tavistock Institute showing document number one. So showing the, um, the first, um, the, the first item, um, the, 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 the proposal that led to the formation of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in 1945. Um, so just to kind of, you know, show the significant, but it was the kind of uh, bringing into being of, a, of, of an organisation that was really preoccupied with social change, uh, with um, understanding culture better, understanding groups, understanding the circumstances that had led to society being where it was in 1945. So I'm just really trying to give that sort of rich, uh, that rich heritage um, and, and, and that rich past, but also give um, uh, this um, th th this sense of a dynamic uh, piece of work, uh, an organisational change work that we did through the archive. So excavational processes, and again, this is one of my images. This was a piece of work that I did to try to sort of show what we were doing. Uh, kind of looking kind of um yeah yeah kind of excavating working under the surface working with dynamics so those kind of squiggly lines at the bottom I was seeing as the sort of uh unconscious the sort of spirits the ghosts of history that all kind of resurfaced as we started to work with the history but through uh excavational processes through the participation through working with groups and really working that out and through as an organizational process, yeah, we were able to sort of like move through perhaps into a different state. So move into a state where we could stand and thrive on the shoulders of our giants rather than be kind of completely and utterly overshadowed by them, which is a kind of risk for an organization that's been around for uh, some years. Um, so just leading on to the festival. Um, so the festival was the culmination of this work. So this was uh, a four day event celebrating 70 years of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. It was the culmination of the work with the archive. So it was, um, and, and really we saw it as an intervention into a much wider system. So the Tavistock Institute as the centre perhaps of a global community of change practitioners. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're the, the, at the centre of a hub with a leader of a community of practice. And there are sort of ambivalent and difficult kind of emotions about that, but to, um, uh, get together and get all of those people together, which is what we did over those four days, um, was quite kind of activating. Um, it was the creation of a, of a space to make sense, to share, to disrupt, uh, to activate this type of work. So the archive sat at the heart of the festival, but the festival began to bring into play new practice, um, installations, performances, alongside walks, talks, group work, more social dreaming. And Steve mentioned evidence-based sort of practice. I mean, we, have, we haven't formally sort of evaluated, but certainly over the years that have followed, there have been a lot of instances of understanding how this work, this work with the archive, the work with the festival has begun to, it's, it's, it's activated, it's provoked senses of change and identity around the work of both the people in the organization and the way people kind of relate to us. Um, so just to show um, an example of one of the events at the festival, this was working with an acting school, um, uh, East 15 acting school. And um, they put on, they did some participatory performances and their students uh, went in, they researched the archive, they uh, gathered bits and pieces that made sense. So these were all social change projects over the years that the Tavistock Institute had been involved in. Um, and they um, and they turned that into a sort of scripted but participatory kind of performance, which took place um, amongst the archival material material um, in one of the locations that we had for the festival. 
Um, so these are some examples, some 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 images um, from from that. Um, so the final piece, really, um, just in this story, is 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 where that's kind of led me, or um, or, or or leading me. Um, and I mentioned um, in the introduction, deepening creative practice. Um, so this is a new program of work, um, deepening creative practice with organisations. It's evolved from the archive. It's evolved from my role uh, within some of our professional development programmes where we're teaching uh, consultancy and change, where we began to work with artists and more explicitly with kind of creative practice. Um, and that has evolved into a specific programme of work um, where um, we're developing um, it's less a professional development program, but it's more, we're trying to think of it more as a program of work where participants become part of this um, and through the program and working with artists um, and Tavistock practitioners and, and, and faculty, um, there are different sort of outputs and interventions, but you know, the, the, the arts and, and, and artist workshops are quite kind of central to the overall program. Um, they're all people concerned with social and organisational change who are taking part. And this image is just part of my prototyping process. So it's also sort of really trying to sort of embody um, the way that you design a programme. So kind of working with it, um, working with paper, with uh, crayons uh, and sort of constructing something um, from my own sense of what it would be that helped to sort of envision, envision and visualise the programme. Um, so within the programme, we're, what we're trying to do is create uh, this sort of complex edge of chaos uh, type of a system where, where there are lots of inputs, there are lots of activities. Um, we're learning through artists, creative workshops, experiential learning. Um, and there's something about that sort of capacity to work with not knowing. So that coming into being of new knowledge and using the arts to uh, really stay in that place of not knowing and seeing what emerges. Within that, we're problematizing artistic language. Uh, so the language of residencies, curation, exhibiting, and, 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 and we're also looking at what is the sort of knowledge system that sort of informs our, our work that underpins it. And that, you know, and challenging it a little bit um, you know, the names, who are they, um, uh, that kind of preoccupation with, you know, who, who, who are the, the thought leaders in our, in our field. Um, and the participants curate their own organisational practice and they experiment with it um, towards this idea of a final exhibiting season. So what's coming out of this and what's being co-created um, this year um, is language of we is it an inquiry of radical openness, um, and this is the, the language that the participants are, have really found through working with the artists, um, and, um, and and working with this becoming of, of new thought and knowledge. So we're just you know getting to the point of completion with the participants. They've worked. They're creating a kind of newspaper publication, which they're calling Open To. Um, which is a wonderful sort of combination of scripts and images and experience and memories of the program. Um, so um, it's it's on a knife edge because and it's and, it, and it's difficult, you know, to, to kind of hold this new program in the current times. Um, but I'm optimistic that we might uh, move forward into a in, into a second uh, iteration of it. Um, so wow, gosh, it's. Um, yeah, I, 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 that, that's, that, that's where I will finish. <laughs> um, and I hope uh, I just yeah. need to stop sharing. Oh, there's one more. That's yeah. But I think I'll finish there with just with that final image, which is from one of the artist workshops. That's, that's awesome. Thank you, Juliet. So we're going to go into small groups and I'd like you all to discuss three things and I'll send this out to you all. And Doug, if you would go to uh, continue the recording and go to group four, Juliet, you get to go with a small group and kind of listen as a fly on the wall and hear them discuss the following questions. What did I hear? What did you hear? As you go in your group, what did you hear? What are your reactions to what you heard? And what are your questions of curiosity? 
And I'd like you to discuss that for about five, seven minutes as a group. We'll come back and share what we discussed in our questions with Juliet. Doug, if you could go to room four, I'm gonna open it up now. If you could go to room four, keep it recording so that you can continue and the people that are watching this later can go on the journey with you to that room. And I'll see you all back in about five to seven minutes. So you should see the room is open, head to your rooms, go say hi, and uh, I'll see you all back in about seven minutes. I'm in the big room. Yeah, I'm not sure how we all got put together in this way. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Absolutely. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna just react initially because Ronell and I were chatting. <laughs> because Ronell is a musician, um, yeah. and so the connection to art was clearly there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, the part that I connected with was um, when you talked about splitting off yourself, like the, the artist and the other side, and I definitely related to that and the idea that it's two separate things. And I love the idea of integrating all into one. In my career, I've definitely had my musician career and then my business career and figuring that they don't have to be so separate is really, um, is really interesting to me. Sorry to call you out there, Rena. <laughs> no, I'm glad you did because I am such a uh, left brain kind of person, although I realize that left brain, right brain thing is outdated at this point, but um, so analytical, the whole idea of how even to integrate them, because I'm a gardener, even though I'm very analytical. So even integrating that element is something that is a new idea really for me, sad as that may sound. I'll also share that, um, so some of the, my reactions, you know, kind of what did I hear, but what my reactions were that the, so the Master of Organization Development Program, the MOD program at BG has, has done uh, an international experience over the last six years or seven years. Of course, we didn't go last year, didn't go this year, but we have in the past and we have visited Florence like three years in a row, um, Florence and Venice. And, and uh, Dr. Deb O'Neill kind of positioned those experiences as the art of business and the business of art, because we were visiting with the uh, Studio Arts College International in Florence, so, which is, uh, we have a great relationship with BGSU. And, and so having our executive master students who were primarily in business or nonprofit world, connecting with master of fine arts students who are doing some design work, but then also doing some art. But the design work was where this connection with our students became really, really close. And the, the amount of connection that they started to see was awesome. And probably one of my favorite examples is when we got to hear from the students who were doing some art restoration. And so they were taking art that had been damaged most of it was damaged in a flood that happened in Florence in the 60s and and they're they're the restoration process and and a lot of what we talk about in OD even when you go in and consult with a company you do no harm right so the first thing is do no harm so you have this piece don't do you're not there to make any do any harm and number two is you're not trying to make it your own you're not taking ownership you got to make it the best it can be as it is. And just those like those two messages like wove right into the work that we do with organizations as a consultant and the same thing that they're doing with the artwork, right? It was, um, so those are the kind of connections that, that I made through Julia's chat is yeah, they're not separate. It's all still part. <laughs> what else? The, the other thing I thought about was like when you talked about the language that's used, so even using the terms like residencies and things like using art language. And my, in my job, we do something similar where I work in jazz and we'll use um, improvisation and swing and rooted in the blues, but use those words more in the context of the business that we're doing. So rooted in the blues would mean like being able to overcome adversity um, in your work. 
And then when you're playing, you play with that blues feeling as well. So that's something that I thought about. And, and improvisation is like, you know, it's not just being able to think on your feet and do something in, in real time, but it's also just the idea of personal expression, you know, and personal freedom too. So how do we bring our own personal freedom expression into the work we're doing within a whole organization? So that that language, I found that tie there as well. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The other part about improv is helping it move forward as well, right? It's not, it's, it's, we're always trying to move forward. It's the yes and thing, right? It's yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to stop the show. Um, for me, I really found a lot of connection in what you're saying because um, as a community theater actress, uh, we know that when we learn our lines so well that we, are no longer hearing the other person because we're anticipating what they're going to say and then we need to say our line. Um, the, the, the time when it comes alive is when we can listen and hold that line and actually hear what our fellow um, actors are saying. Mm -hmm. on stage. And so I was thinking a lot about that as you were talking about the, you know, connecting the art with, with the OD. That makes me think about the poem and the, 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 the person. So really getting into the sort of detail of, of, of who the person is, yeah, and, and, and allowing that connection with them. Because sometimes it's, we, we kind of defend against doing that, I think. Mm -hmm. We separate ourselves from, from, from who, who is at the heart of the, 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 the social change, yeah. And that's been kind of a struggle as, you know, I was getting into this program and learning more about OD. I was like, are you, are you going to be so thinking about that, that you're not really looking at the systems and the people that you're trying to help because you're really mm -hmm. thinking about what you need to do for them. So that's been a concern for me. So I really connected with the poem, Julia. So I just, mm -hmm. um, last semester I took a, uh, a, it was a relational communications class, but we used poetic inquiry as a method for our qualitative approach and, and a research project that we did. And it was amazing to me as I <clears throat> took the transcripts of two interviews that we'd done with older, older women and, and really them sharing their lives and began to create a poem one it changed my thought process of, of a poem you know it doesn't rhyme it, it, it is what it is it, it, it's what comes out of the data but two just how it really told the story differently you, you found so many new nuggets of information mm -hmm. as you pull out the repetition as you pull out the the key phrases that they were sharing throughout their lives that really um it brought and when we shared it back with the participants, they even said, wow, this, this is just a different approach and a different thought. And it really helps embody my life in such few words. And so it was just an amazing approach. And, and from someone, I mean, I'm like Dr. Brodkey and love myself a good data set, you know? So <laughs> to, uh, to really shift into that more creative approach of, of qualitative analysis, it was yeah, fantastic. Very, very appreciated. And actually we have, um, I'll send you the invite. We have that professor, she's going to be in um, our July symposia talking about poetic inquiry as a method. Research. Oh, great. So I can send you that invite if you're mm. able to attend. Mm. Yeah, I, cause I think there's something about the, um, we have at the Institute, some of the researchers are, are more open to working with creative and seeing, you know, and allowing things like poems to enter into the data uh, and, the, and the understanding. And I, and I think there's a way to, there's a bit of a way to go for that to begin to be seen, you know, as rigorous as well, is, is, isn't it? You know, what, what, that there is science behind a poem as data, but, but how, how do we kind of, you know, take it that, 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 that step further? There's certainly more and more interest in that, I think, in, amongst, academics in the UK, yeah. Yeah, I, I think for me, something that is important to keep in mind is how humans, especially if we're talking about organization development and change, mm -hmm. is humans like stories. Humans are not real mm -hmm. good at accepting evidence that's contrary to an already formed mm -hmm. opinion. 
but they will go along with you in a story and then sometimes be surprised when suddenly things are counter to what they expected or wanted. Mm -hmm. In fact, that novelty can be a so source of enjoyment and entertainment. Mm -hmm. So that, that I agree is, is a way to make that connection. Did everyone else see the prompt from Steve? I'm not sure exactly what that was about. There was it a was go back in a minute, wasn't it? Would, would the, he'll be close, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> Which is cue for head into a great discussion and the quantum leap will pull us all back just as we get to that pivot point, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, you do ex experiential work in the program and group work. Are you doing? Um, I would say I uh, not yet. I just as we um and and Tom and Dr. Brodke uh, just as we head in the cohort one heads in to their mm -hmm. their their action research year. Yes, I believe that's probably. Yeah. Uh, element of it but I think if we had cohort one students here they would say yes, yes. from the use of self class um, uh, I think it's just different and they for better or worse do not do that in my classes where it's research methods and data analysis <laughs> so but maybe I'll think about the whole storytelling aspect at least so thank you <laughs> And I assume that Dr. O'Neill probably puts that in her qualitative research class that she teaches over the summer, right? Or in, uh, maybe that's a fall class. Fall. Yeah, so shall we, then it gets to the point where we can't, there's no more room to begin any further conversation, doesn't it? <laughs> see you, see you in the back, back. processing. All right. <laughs> Well, Juliet, we have had a lot of fun talking, and I bet you were having fun as a fly on the wall listening to that group talk, and they probably peppered you with questions and all kinds of cool stuff. So um, one of the things uh, I'd like to do is jump in, and I'm going to throw the um, uh, baton. Uh, we'll, we'll use the metaphor of a, a um, canvas. We'll, we'll toss the canvas. Uh, over to David, are you here or gone? I think he had to step away. So we'll toss it over to who wants to, to share a little bit of what you talked about in your group and maybe a question that you have. So David Harkins. Yeah, the other David. Um, I, we were, I was in a group with Gary and Tammy and Carol and we talked some about the integration. Actually, that was ultimately the focus of it, it was how to integrate the various aspects of ourselves and 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 we were really fascinated with uh, julia your ability to integrate the art in the, your work and art and love of art into your work and and we were sort of working through that and um and we were talking about we at before we were cut off we were talking about imagery and carol had shared that her her image if she would were, were to create one was an octopus with the head trying to control all these various things that were out there in the world and 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 my image was a was a seal you know that was more balanced in in all the sides but i but i found myself wondering maybe i should be like an octopus as we were we were we were talking is how do you all these different interests that i have so i guess maybe the question would be along the lines of how did you arrive at that point where you um you you found that way to integrate your interests into the work into the work that you you are doing you you did mention i recall that that was a difficult thing for you to do uh, particularly with your art i think it, it has been a process and 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 in many ways it does relate to the to, to the science a bit it, it relates to a bit to complexity or to working with paradox and to kind of um allowing myself to work with two things at once and to kind of recognize that in working with those two things at once something interesting happens 
you start to kind of see things or allow things to be in you in a kind of very, very diff different way. And, and that happened through the allowance really of, of, of a studio. So my studio coming into my working life and practice, not as a separate thing, but through part of my day-to-day -day work. So I have a studio in Elephant and Castle <laughs> and, and uh, uh, not far from, from where I live. And, and I will be working in there with my, uh, with my with my phone, my work phone, and the emails that are coming in on it, and some of them will be very organisational and logistical, and all of those kinds of things. And I might be uh, I might be working on my drawings at the same time, and and it doesn't always work. <laughs> you know, sometimes I get pulled more into one thing and more into the other. But more and more, I'm realising that by doing that, I'm allowing I'm allowing the artistic part to kind of infuse my the rest of my work and, and inform it. Um, it's a, it is a bit of complexity theory in action of working with paradox in your own your own little your own body your own your own being. Wow. Oh. How, how much of that I know many of us also and we talked about this some too many of us also struggle with this idea of doing versus being mm. and um, and I wonder how much mm. of that uh, it, from your perspective, how much of having that integration provides you that balance for self-care and allow that being aspect allows you to be better at the doing when you're doing? Yeah, I think, I think, I think because it allows, it allows, it allows that identity to settle wholly in the self. And, and, and that's, what's been the journey of, the identity settling wholly, you know, that I, I, that I can be all of those things. And then that enables me to yeah, be less hard on myself, less judgmental about the moments that I'm this or the moments that I'm that, but yet bring it all, 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 always in and, and, and be working across all of those, those different things at once. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's good. And Thank you. Yes. And anybody else want to ask a question? So, so I have I have one thing, and you all will have one more chance. Uh, but so, one of the things that really poked me in a, such a good way is this notion of stepping out of one's comfort zone through expression in the arts. And as one steps out of that, I think there's an invitation. And I'm curious for you is, is, is if you have a story of transformation as someone stepped out, because I think it's an invitation to our, our best self, an invitation to something better, our next self. And a lot of times, how do you get out of, how do you become your best self without stepping out of your comfort zone, right? You can't stay in your comfort zone and become your better self. That's what you're leaving behind. So I think art and inviting people like you did at the opening, where a group of leaders create a poem with the person they serve at the center. And in that discomfort and not being creative and in that they found mm -hmm. something more whole about them so they could be the leader that people want to follow. Do you have a story of maybe how the art was used that it was a transformative experience for a leader or for someone? And how you use the tool like that? Um, well. I'm just trying to ground myself maybe in what. And it could even be that one at the opening. How did it transform that group? How did it transform those leaders? How did they, from the beginning to the end of the day, not being creative, how did that art pull out their best self? And did they well, become we were, different? I suppose we were just talking to, we've, we've just, just been working with them this morning, actually. And we've been, and, and, and part of it was we've, we're, we've been working with them a little bit around uh, the question of the group, you know, so our, our, our identity within the group um, and again, a sort of Tavistock kind of, you know, um, sense of um, uh, the group tussling, you know, that, uh, you know, as individuals, we, we struggle with our identity as members of the group or not as members of the group. So by entering into the group, are we, do we kind of lose ourselves? Yeah. Do we lose our identity by being part of the group or, or part of the organisation, um, or, or, or 
or, or and how do we kind of retain our identity I'm not explaining it very well but we would we're tussling with that as a dynamic if that if that makes sense and and, and I suppose the work around the uh, the poems and creating these kind of personas um oh no I think kind of helped to sort of I'm you know I'm I'm in that place of I, I stutter a bit about kind of you know new thought but the the the, the personas helped to kind of make the link between the individual and the and the group and I'm, I'm not explaining that very well and i'm not explaining that very well sorry it's okay it's all right um I, what i take away from what you're saying is that in that collective process of creating they find a way to connect their individual identity into mm. the group identity and it helps them to form group identity in a way that they can see themselves yeah. they can see themselves in that poem they can see themselves in our if they're creating that you know they're co-creating the yeah. creation has a little bit of them in it and it's like a manifestation for me to look at of myself as a part of the group i get to now see the picture of us together and i can see myself in that picture because i yeah. and what's interesting i'll just wrap up with this that google did a bunch of research on groups and one of the best characteristics of the highest performing groups in google were groups where everybody had a voice where they made sure that everybody mm. had a voice and what contributed to the conversation or what they were talking about. Groups that didn't do that were lower performing. So this notion of voice inclusion and a product that I can see myself in, whatever it may be, helps me to say, have my individual identity in that, I think is what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really great. So any closing comments or questions? In yeah, the chat, nice, what I'd like Nicole. you to do, we're going to do a chatter fall. What is your takeaway? How are you different leaving today? So in the chat, don't hit enter. Just type, what's the appreciation of Juliet? What do you appreciate? What is a takeaway? What are you walking away? How are you different from this experience? And What do you uh, call it? A chatter, a chatter fall. Chatter fall. Chatter fall. Oh. And so what they're going to do is they're not going to hit enter. We're all going to type and we won't hit enter. So... Okay, one, two, three. So appreciation and thank you and integration and all kinds of uh, reflective thoughts there. And so Juliet, thank you. I, I really appreciate your time today. This is a super introduction and start because we're going to get to know you even better as time goes and we'll see you in person in about a year. So I yeah, I really that. hope so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're looking forward. To yes. That. Yeah. So we, us too. Yeah. Yeah. And so watch this space. Yeah. Yes. And there's a link in here for you all to uh, get to the Tavistock newsletter. Uh, so I would sign up for that. And otherwise we have a session next month. Uh, and we have our fourth Wednesday of every month is our symposia. Who's our feature next month, Doug? Next month, we have Matt Monahan that's going to be talking about his work in shaping the future of ODE. So it's, um, he's been working over the past three years with uh, over 300 people and like really building out what the um, needs are as well as the capabilities to be an, a, a great OD practitioner. So it's, it's a fantastic talk. Looking forward awesome. to it. Awesome. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing you all. Take care, Juliet. Enjoy your evening and for the rest of, enjoy the rest of your day. And bye for now, everybody. <laughs>